away. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Thomas Chandler and I'm a biostatistician with the Norton Infectious Diseases Institute, um, which is a part of the Norton Research Institute. And I'm also a member of the newly formed Data Science Corps here within the Norton Research Institute, which brings together um, a bunch of talented biostatisticians and bioinformaticists um, within Norton with the goal of facilitating uh, data analysis for research. Um, so for today's presentation, we are going to go over community-acquired pneumonia and the immunocompromised hosts, uh, specifically epidemi epidemiology and outcomes within this population. Um, and the results that I'm going to present today are going to be from um, a study that I worked on with uh, principal investigator, Dr. Ramirez. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So just to kind of get us started, I'm going to throw out some terminology for us to get familiar with. So with um, medical research, we love a good acronym. So throughout the presentation, you'll see CAP, which is going to be community acquired pneumonia and immunocompromised host is going to be um, abbreviated by ICHs. And um, so uh, those are pretty easy. So just wanted to get those out of the way. So to clarify any confusion moving forward. So a little bit of background on this topic. Um, so the CDC has estimated that 3% of adults are immunocompromised in the United States. And this estimate is likely an underestimate um, due to recent medical treatments um, with the use of biologics for a variety of diseases. And then there's also been increased survival in patients with transplantation and um, neoplastic disease and um, also improved survival among patients with HIV. So this 3% may not be the best estimate, um, but it's what the CDC uh, most recently published. And a little background about community-acquired pneumonia. It is a common cause of hospitalization in adults in the United States, and it's the primary cause of mortality due to an infectious organism. And when um, an immunocompromised host develops community-acquired pneumonia, uh, this infection is often complex. And what we mean by that is it's complicated by super infection. So infection of another organism, um, drug toxicities, empyema, sepsis, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So all of these complications can occur when an immunocompromised host is uh, develops community acquired pneumonia. Uh, and most recently during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we saw how immunocompromised hosts were disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic, um, and it was reported that they experienced higher rates of hospitalization, ICU care, uh, mechanical ventilation, and death. And this kind of poor outcomes among immunocompromised hosts is well documented. However, a few studies have evaluated the clinical outcomes and epidemiology in this high-risk population. So that's kind of setting up the problem for this study. Um, where we know that there, there's poor outcomes, but the epidemiology and clinical outcomes of immunocompromised hosts with CAP is not really well defined. Um, so the objective of this study was to define the epidemiology and clinical outcomes um, hospitalized with CAP in the city of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so the study design that we used was a secondary data analysis of a prospective cohort um, of hospitalized patients with community-acquired pneumonia. And um, in this study, uh, we captured hospitalized pneumonia patients over a two-year period. Um, and this study is usually referred to as the University of Louisville Pneumonia Study. And the results from this study have been uh, published already. So here is the um, main article, the parent study that we use, um, that, the, that this particular study used the data from to estimate the immunocompromise, the rate of immunocompromise among community acquired pneumonia and also um, the geospatial and clinical outcomes. So in the University of Global Pneumonia Study, like I said, we captured um, hospitalizations over a two-year period. And from um, an incidence and numbers perspective, it's always 
the best case scenario to capture all of the disease that you're looking for. Um, it just makes, it gives you the ability to make uh, incidence calculations and uh, test other hypotheses within that population. Um, if you compare it to like a randomized controlled trial, you can think about how um, in those controlled trials, um, the idea is to identify a sample and then generalize that result to the population. But here with the ULPS, we have the uh, entire population captured since we captured all pneumonias. Um, so it's just kind of, you, you can kind of make the argument that large observational studies uh, can kind of approximate the results of a randomized controlled trial, which is generally looked at as the gold standard in research. Um, so in this uh, parent study, we identified 7,449 adults hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia um, over the two study years. And the 7,449 is going to um, encapsulate unique patients. Um, over the two years, patients were hospitalized multiple times. Um, but for the purposes of this study, we just wanted to focus on the unique patients uh, and just identify the rate of immunocompromised within those unique patients. Um, so starting off with our 7,449, the goal, the first step we needed to take was to identify the patients who were hospitalized um, with CAP and were not immunocompromised, and then also identify the CAP patients who were immunocompromised. And to be able to do this, we need to have some criteria um, to identify our immunocompromised patients. And um, to do that, we use immunocompromising conditions or treatments um, that the CDC has put out. And we abstracted um, information from the medical records to identify if these patients had any of these immunocompromising conditions. And this definition is really important because if we kind of miss the mark, then we may over and uh, may overestimate or underestimate the number of immunocompromised within our community-acquired pneumonia patients. Um, but basically the criteria we were looking for was primary immunodeficiency disease, um, advanced stage cancer, which um, advanced stage was defined as stage three or four um, solid cancers or a hematologic cancer. And the staging is a little different depending on um, the type of cancer that the patient has. Uh, but within this, I didn't uh, report it in this presentation, but we did take that in consideration when I when we were identifying the advanced stage cancers. Um, another immunocompromising condition is advanced HIV infection, which is, which is determined by a CD4 lymph lymphocyte count of less than 200 or a ratio of less than 14%. And this definition is um, consistent with an AIDS definition. Um, so due to advances, as I mentioned earlier, in treatments for HIV, um, the immunosuppression that these patients are experiencing is improved with the improved therapy in that group. Um, so really not focusing on just an HIV diagnosis, it's the advanced HIV infections, which are generally not completely controlled yet by the um, therapies available today. And then uh, we also looked at solid organ transplantation. Um, generally, these patients are immunosuppressed um, uh, to uh, immunosuppressed um, to um, make sure that the that there's no rejection with uh, the organ that they are receiving. There's a, we also looked at hematopoietic stem cell transplantations, uh, cancer chemotherapies, uh, biological immune modulators, and the high-dose corticosteroid, which was probably the most challenging um, criteria to determine. Uh, I think we have some of the ID pharmacists on our call, uh, so I have to give them a shout out for helping us determine kind of what this high-dose corticosteroid therapy was going to be. And so what we settled with was 20 milligrams of prednisone or an equivalent for at least 14 days prior to hospitalization. Um, and the equivalencies, um, I didn't report in this presentation, but if there's a corticosteroid um, that a patient's on, 
we basically found the equivalent to a, the dose that's mentioned here. Um, and then the last criteria was the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. So now we kind of have what we're looking for in our population. So now we can identify that those patients and then come up with a rate um, among our cap hospitalizations. So I'm going to bring back up uh, this little figure with um, that's supposed to capture all of our 7,000 patients. So once we kind of looked through the medical records and identified our patients, we found that 761 of the 7,449 patients were immunocompromised. And this was kind of one of the first key findings of this study. Um, so you can think of it as one in 10 patients, one in 10 adults hospitalized with pneumonia will be immunocompromised. And then among those immunocompromised patients, it was also important to kind of quantify uh, the immunocompromising conditions or treatments um, that were leading to that immunocompromisation. And the most prevalent one was advanced stage cancer. Um, over 50% of the immunocompromised hosts had some form of advanced stage cancer. Um, after that, it was cancer chemotherapy, the high dose long-term corticosteroid therapy, and then um, the disease-modifying disease modifying, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, um, advanced HIV infection, um, those were less frequent in the immunocompromised hosts. Um, one thing I do want to mention about this figure is that it's not these categories aren't mutually exclusive. And I think the easiest example there is the advanced stage cancer and the cancer chemotherapy. Um, there's these two categories aren't going to be mutually exclusive. There's going to be patients who have um, you know, both of these immunocompromising conditions. Um, but we still want it to quantify kind of um, how much of each one was prevalent in our uh, study. So now that we have our two populations, we can kind of, we can start to summarize um, some characteristics within our groups. Um, so this is kind of, this is referred to as table one um, in a manuscript or any um, scientific writings. So basically we have, we just want to identify those characteristics that are different between our two groups. Um, and right off the bat, um, you'll notice that immunocompromised hosts are generally younger than the non-immunocompromised hosts. And we had a little bit of a discussion um, as to why they would be younger. Generally, you would expect um, an older patient to be um, more likely to be hospitalized. Um, and there's not an, ex an exact consensus as to why they're younger, but um, it could pot potentially be due to um, a lower threshold for hospitalization among immunocompromised hosts um, and other factors as well. Um, and you can see that a larger majority of immunocompromised hosts were former smokers. Um, so uh, that could play into the type of cancer that they have, um, potentially could be a lung cancer um, from prior um, smoking habits. Um, and the comorbid disease that we reported in this study, uh, we found that obesity and diabetes were actually higher among non-immunocompromised hosts. And um, what we were thinking with, we think this might be related to kind of the advanced age in this population. Um, so the, immuno, the non-immunocompromised hosts, since they're older, um, may have a higher comorbid burden. Um, and you can see that liver disease is higher among our immunocompromised mm -hmm. hosts. Um, and this is most likely related to solid organ transplantation. I believe a liver transplant was the most common among our population. Um, so this is just kind of a understanding like the characteristics within our populations. And when you are Talking about an immunocompromised host, there's always going to be interest in the etiology of the pneumonia. Um, so this table here is going to display the top five etiologies identified among immunocompromised hosts and non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, one big caveat to this table is that all of the testing was dictated by standard of care. 
So it real, was really at the discretion of the treating physician. Um, but this was just what was reported in the medical records and uh, what we were able to pull. And what sticks out to me the most is less than 25% of each uh, strata had a pathogen identified. Um, so I think right there, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in diagnostic techniques. Um, and you'll notice a, um, the bacterial um, causes of pneumonia aren't too different between these two groups. However, um, and this is a consistent with other studies that have shown uh, bacterial pneumonias in HIV patients is similar to the non-HIV patients. Um, so it's not um, uncommon that these pathogen, the rates of pathogens within each group are the same, um, but there's a lot of limitations to this data, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and just to highlight again, only an etiology was only identified in 24% of immunocompromised hosts and 23% of non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, and the limit, just to talk about the limitations again, um, immunocompromised hosts are generally at risk for what are called opportunistic infections. Um, and these can be bacteria, fungi, viruses, or parasites. And essentially, in a normal immunocompetent individual, these infections are usually cleared by the immune system. However, due to the immunosuppression in our immunocompromised hosts, they're not able to um, fight the infection in the same way. So some examples of this are um, pneumocystis pneumonia, which is generally seen in advanced HIV infection. Um, and aspergillus species are have been documented in solid organ and hematopoietic transplantations, uh, certain blood malignancies, and then also among the high dose and the long-term corticosteroid users. And there's also a higher prevalence of parasitic infections in the high dose and long-term corticosteroids as well. So I just kind of wanted to um, lay the foundation down that with being immunocompromised comes a higher risk for certain pathogens that the general population isn't necessarily at risk for. And um, so going back to this table, we identified more pathogens than what are listed here. I just wanted to um, list out the top five. And, um, but we did identify some opportunistic pathogens in our immunocompromised hosts. Um, and the ones we identified were the aspergillus species, the Canada albicans, the pneumocystis pneumonia, and cytomegalovirus, which are generally um, not seen in our non-immunocompromised hosts. And these uh, opportunistic infection, infections only accounted for 7% uh, of the etiologies in the immunocompromised hosts. But like I said before, there's a lot of limitations with the, um, the identified etiologies uh, due to the standard of care testing and um, the diagnostic uh, procedures or the diagnostic techniques for certain fungi, for example, aren't as developed for bacteria as they are as for bacteria or viruses. Um, so there's limitations um, all around when identifying an etiology. Uh, one uh, infection that I kind of wanted to highlight um, is histoplasmosis, and this is caused by a fungus that's endemic to states that border the Ohio River Valley, and just wanted to point that out that there's a higher rate of this infection um, where we are currently located, um, and as when spores are inhaled in a non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, they can develop mild disease, but it's generally cleared by the immune system. Um, the same isn't seen in immunocompromised hosts. So um, I just thought, think it's interesting that um, we have endemic uh, opportunistic infections um, you know, almost right in our back door. Um, and we didn't report chest imaging um, among our population in this presentation, but I still wanted to touch on it a little bit because um, it's 
important to understand uh, the caveats with chest imaging when treating patients with community-acquired pneumonia who are immunocompromised. Um, specifically, radiology can be unreliable in immunocompromised hosts due to decreased inflammatory response um, in the lungs. Uh, so these almost these infections can be a little insidious in a way. Um, and a, an example of that is patients with tuberculosis and who have a history of a advanced HIV will usually have um, a normal radiology compared to um, the non-immunocompromised non patients with a TB infection. And then CT scans um, are generally the better imaging to use uh, among the immunocompromised hosts. Uh, it can better visualize the abnormalities within the lung, and that can help a physician understand the extent of the disease if there's multiple sites of injury um, within the lungs, and then also can aid in an earlier diagnosis and improve therapeutic procedures. Uh, so going back to the study results, um, so here is the geospatial results from our study, and we have four maps depicted here. And if you just kind of look at each one without knowing what they are, you can see that three of those maps look kind of similar. Um, and But actually the underlying data that's mapped is different. So a uh, map A is going to highlight the immunocompromised hosts with community acquired pneumonia in Louisville, Kentucky. So the darker the color, there's a higher rate of hospitalization for these individuals. Uh, so you can see the, the outline here is Jefferson County, um, if you aren't familiar with it, and where these hot spots per se are um, usually, this is located kind of in the downtown area. Um, so it, once again, kind of an area that we're pretty close to. And um, basically, you can see that there's a higher rate of hospitalization in this area. And to kind of um, can make a comparison to the underlying population, uh, figure B is going to uh, map the rate of poverty within Jefferson County. So you can kind of see where poverty spikes, there's also a spike in hospitalization uh, due to CAP and an immunocompromised host. And then you can also see figure C, which looks at a black or Afri African-American race within Jefferson County. Um, the same areas that have a high hospitalization rate for, I mean, for a cap in the immunocompromised hosts um, also have higher rates of black or African-American race. And figure D is going to visualize the distribution of advanced age within Jefferson County. Um, you can kind of see it's almost an inverse relationship to where the more east end you go, the more um, the higher the age population is. How and generally you would think that advanced age would be associated with hospitalization or uh, more severe disease, but we're not necessarily seeing that. Um, we don't really see that same trend uh, when you compare it to the hospitalization rates or the immunocompromised host with pneumonia. Um, so basically here, we kind of hypothesize that hospitalization rates may be influenced uh, due to racial and other socioeconomic factors uh, in Jefferson County. And one caveat to this is this data is very ecological. Um, so there's other factors at play and that we couldn't really consider for this analysis. Um, but I think it is interesting to kind of show the relationship between um, poverty and race and then also the relationship with hospitalization due to pneumonia and immunocompromised hosts. Uh, another in study endpoint we looked at was length of hospitalization. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with it, this is a survival curve. Um, we, we use these to depict time to event data, um, such as length of hospitalization. 
So you can see um, the x-axis has the number of days that the patient is hospitalized. And then on the y-axis, we have the percent who are hospitalized. So at day zero, 100% of our population was still, pop was still hospitalized. And this red line is going to map our immunocompromised hosts. And this blue line is going to show our non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, and basically what you can see is that the non-immunocompromised hosts are getting discharged more uh, quickly. So the median length of stay for, an, for immunocompromised hosts was six days and five days for the non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, and it's only a one day difference in length of stay between these two groups, but one day in the hospital, um, as we all know, is you know not more than just spending one day in the hospital. There's charges associated with it. Um, there's increased burden on the healthcare system. Um, so that, that one day of hospitalization uh, makes a pretty big difference between these two groups. And if we look at um, the mortality rate between immunocompromised and non-immunocompromised hosts, um, you can see that the rate of mortality uh, among our immunocompromised hosts is almost a two-fold increase at each time point, um, which is you know, very surprising to see. And if you look at our one-year mortality, um, over 50% of the immunocompromised hosts were dead at one year. Um, so if you're a physician and you see, you know, four patients who are immunocompromised with CAP um, in a month, you can hypothesize that at least two of those patients would be dead at one year. Um, so definitely think this warrants, you know, the uh, importance of prevention among immunocompromised hosts um, and other studies among this population to identify, you know, the factors that are really contributing to this high mortality rate. We also visualize mortality, uh, time to mortality with the survival curve. Um, so similar to length of stay at day zero, all of our patients were alive. And as you move across the y-axis, as more patients start to experience mortality, uh, you can kind of see how the immunocompromised hosts are dying more quickly when compared to the non-immunocompromised hosts. Um, and once again, the median survival time for immunocompromised hosts is around 300 days. Um, however, as we stated before, over 50% of ICHs will be hospitalized with CAP, uh, who were hospitalized with CAP will be dead at one year. Um, so I Working on this analysis, seeing this result was probably the most, you know, shocking and eye-opening. Um, when you discuss an immunocompromised host, you obviously um, know that they're at a higher risk for poor outcomes. But to see how, um, to see that degree of difference between these two groups, it was, you know, a very uh, interesting finding. And there's definitely some areas for hopefully improvement in the survival of these patients. Uh, so a few other clinical endpoints that we assess between these two groups, but weren't significantly different, um, was in hospital cardiac events, the use of invasive mechanical ventilation, vasopressor use, admission to the ICU, and clinical failure. Um, and one thing that kind of sticks out to me uh, is that the closer you are to the index hospitalization between these two groups, the outcomes aren't really different, but the farther uh, you look out in time, um, the more difference you can kind of see in mortality and other long-term outcomes. So it's kind of, it, it can almost be misleading to think that the short-term outcomes are similar between these two populations. But in reality, in the long-term, the immunocompromised hosts aren't really um, doing nearly as well as the non-immunocompromised hosts. Uh, so I know we moved through things up very quickly. Um, so just to kind of summarize the key findings uh, from this study, one in 10 hospitalized patients with CAP are immunocompromised. Um, among our immunocompromised patients, advanced stage cancer was the most frequent immunocompromising condition. 
and it was seen in over half of the patients who were immunocompromised. Uh, risk for hospitalization may be influenced by socioeconomic disparities and other racial disparities. And ICHs have a twofold increase in mortality uh, compared to non-ICHs non at each time point. And so that kind of wraps up uh, my presentation. So thank you for sitting through and listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Anybody have any questions for Thomas? Thank you for putting this together. It's always very interesting to see um, how the demographic of Louisville fits in with the community acquired pneumonia um, mm -hmm. uh, data. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Thomas? Any final comments? Uh, NIDI, we have some future studies around immunocompromised hosts and community acquired pneumonia. So the work in this population isn't necessarily done. So we're always trying to generate new information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Very interesting. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next week um, when Dr. Junkins presents on microbiology. Have a good day. Thank you.